Hello, everyone. Today is Thursday, March 17, 2016, and this is the week in charts. This week's charts is brought to you by me, and I would like you to check out my trading service. I also have a delayed version of this. If you hold off till the end of the show, I'll show you how to sign up for that. But you can get started and see the real-time version, real-time portfolio setups, which are, or at least one setup for today, actually. Uh, and you can see that immediately. You can sign up during the show, and you get the setup immediately for today. And today I'm going to talk a lot about time and waiting for things. And one thing that people always are saying, like, uh, well, if I sign up for service, how soon will it pay for itself? And and that's a tough question to answer. Uh, it might pay for itself uh, for the next five years today alone. But obviously I can't guarantee that. And the other thing, too, is you must be willing to, to follow it, and that's um, – and that can be tough sometimes because a lot of times people try to outsmart the system, try to get in early, uh, try to take profits early, uh, exit stocks when they're not um, doing that well. And we're going to talk a lot about uh, patience today. And I, it's a bit of a carryover from last week, but I'm going to talk a, a little bit about that. And that will make a lot more sense in just a few minutes here. Uh, we're, it's also brought to you uh, this week by the Barking Squirrel Coffee Roasters, BarkingSquirrelCoffee.com. It's good stuff. I had some this morning. I've been drinking the Ethiopian and the Costa Rican. I think I like the Costa Rican, but the Ethiopian, I don't know. I think I'm liking that uh, maybe even better. And it's also brought, brought to you by London Investment Week. Uh, today they have the round the clock trader, which I will be participating in. And I'm going to talk about getting into emerging trends early, regardless of the time frame or the market. And that will make a lot more sense once you see the webinar. Later today. So check that out. If you have time, just go to my website, DaveLandry.com, and there's a countdown for that webinar. So check it out. It's uh, Again, it's for a third party. It's for London Investment Week, and it's their Around the Clock Trader Series. In fact, if you want to log in after this webinar, as soon as this webinar finishes, there's some other speakers there, too, uh, that you can check out. Oh, before I forget, there's a disclaimer screen. As you know, all predictions are about the future, and a lot of stuff could happen between now and then. And as I often say, if you've been trading for more than a day, as you know, you can lose money trading. So this week, I want to continue my talk about trading psychology. And it's kind of interesting. When I first got into this business, it was methodology, 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 methodology. And then I realized that the money management was important, too. And then the third part the third pillar of trading, which cannot be separated, is trading psychology. And trading psychology is very important, and that's something that you'll notice that I've been focusing on more and more. I'm still perfecting my methodology, and I think in this business you will always be perfecting your methodology. But the most important thing is being able to follow your methodology, both good, both bad, and and different and the enemy you created is time and i see this all the time everybody's at a big rush to get started and as i think i wrote in layman's you would never say oh tonight i'm going to go to wally world and i'm going to buy some exacto knives maybe some rags too while i'm there because i probably need some rags and then tomorrow, I'm going to, start, going to start operating on people. So, but in trading, it happens all the time. And I think one of the reasons is the barrier to entry is pretty darn easy. All you need is a trading account. Uh, yeah, I used to say you need a computer. Well, everybody's got a computer nowadays. And everyone has a smartphone nowadays. So a lot of people just run around trading on their smartphones. So... It will take a little bit of time, and I think people put these self-imposed deadlines on themselves when it comes to trading. And you have to think about it like any other career. And I often say this to people as they're learning. It's like, uh, you know, you're a pilot. How long did it take you to become a pilot? You studied quite a bit before you just grabbed the stick, right? How long did it take you to become a, do a doctor, lawyer, an automatic transmission mechanic? Okay, You don't just start right out the gate. It's going to take a little time. So 
this is a little bit of a redox from last week. But I think it's very relevant. First of all, you want to make sure you've studied a methodology thoroughly. And you know the good, the bad, and the ugly. And you want to make sure that methodology is viable. Now, when you first begin researching a methodology, obviously you're looking for the good. You can't look for the bad and expect to find something. As I often preach when I talk about proper stock selection, it's like the counterfeit currency detectives. A good counterfeit currency detective does not study fakes. In fact, when they learn how to study to recognize counterfeits, what do they do? They study the genuine article. And once you know what a good setup looks like, once you look know what a good set stock looks like, then, like the counterfeit currency detectives, the fakes are obvious, okay? So you will have to look for the good when you're starting out, and then once you embrace and understand the bad and the ugly, then you look to perfect the good and get better at your, at your craft. But the problem that I see quite often is that People forget about the bad and they forget about the ugly. And I know I've told the story a thousand times and I'll probably tell it a thousand more. And it's not just this one individual because this happens quite often. But somebody recently emailed me their system and, and please don't. And I might write in tomorrow's column that if you want to, then send me a $5,000 check, non-refundable deposit, and then be prepared for me to rip apart your system. But most people don't want to hear about the bad. And one gentleman sent me a system not too long ago that made a very little bit of money on every trade, but it had a 50% drawdown, 40-something, okay? Round numbers, 50%. And he said, yeah, but it made money by the end of the year. And it's like, well, could you really live through a 50% drawdown? And by the way, if you do have a 50% drawdown and something that has a 100% hindsight – Trust me, in real markets, that drawdown is going to be much larger. So personally, could you live through it? If you were running money, would your clients live through it? No, your clients would, would haul ass long, long before then. And then you'd have to watch in anguish as it came back. Now, I don't want to beat this guy up too much on the system because maybe he does have something that needs a little tweaking. But the reality is people people – it's kind of like the – a few good men, you know, you want the truth, you can't handle the truth. So you have to be willing to play your own devil's advocate when it comes to a system. Now, I talk a lot about my stuff. One thing I've been criticized for is that occasionally I'll say that it's streaky, and it is streaky. You print money for a while, and then you go back to grinding it out. But I've learned to embrace that. I've wrapped my head around that and learned to live with that. So Making decisions is easy. I'm often make a joke at my wife's expense. It's like making a decision to marry the most beautiful woman I ever met was a pretty damn easy decision. Living with her is not. Okay. Usually ask for permission, but it just kind of slipped out this time. So you have to make those decisions, and more importantly, you have to live with it, and you have to know how are you going to live through the methodology. I'm going to talk a lot about that in just one second. So not only should you focus on what could go right as you become more and more experienced and educated and climb up that learning curve, you're going to find yourself looking for what could go wrong. And more importantly, you'll also learn to be more and more selective, and that's something I'm going to talk about in a few minutes. Now, again, I took this, uh, this slide, and I copied it almost verbatim, from last week, but it really dovetails into what I'm talking about. In fact, this whole presentation today is is because I talked to a lot of people since last week, and the columns seem to be fairly popular, and it brought up a lot of interesting conversations with you guys and girls. And it got me thinking that maybe I need to elaborate on these things. I mean, one thing that I wanted to do, and I didn't even get to that, uh, this week is I want to talk about the, the process. It, it, maybe if we have a little time later today, we can talk about the process and how important the process is. 
But one of the problems that I often see, and again, borrowing from last week, is that people aren't adequately capitalized to trade. And that's a huge problem. If you have an extra 100K lying around and you're able to risk 2% of that on every trade, and if you're learning to trade, risk one quarter percent of that, even something very just minuscule, minuscule, then yeah, you make a little money, you lose a little money, who cares while you're learning and you get your feet wet. But if you only have a few thousand dollars and you need that money to pay your groceries and your rent, it's going to be a hell of a lot harder to trade. Because as soon as you get a winner, you're going to take those profits so you can pay your rent and buy your groceries instead of letting that ride. And the problem is you may not ever get to a winner because if you've been at this for a while, you'll learn and you'll know that a lot of times trades will go against you. So you so you may not even get to that winner to begin with. As soon as you begin losing a little money, it's like I can't lose much more money because I won't be able to pay my rent this month, so I better get out of this trade. And then what happens, it takes off the next day without you. So by not being adequately capitalized, you end up putting a lot of these self-imposed constraints on yourself. If you think education is expensive, try ignorance. Derek Bott. I think it's supposed to be Bach. I, my apologies. I, I meant to change that. Bach with it with the K. Because um, somebody on Facebook was – it actually became really popular on Facebook. Somebody liked it or something, and he's like, I can't find this Bot guy. I'm like, oh, jeez, it's supposed to be Bach. My apologies. And – what I've been telling people, what I wrote about last week, is that if you don't have enough money to trade, now this is a little soft sell here, but it doesn't have to necessarily be my methodology. But what I would suggest, if you don't have a lot of money, is take what little money that you do have, if you truly are passionate. And I think if God gives it, gives you a burning desire, I think he also gives you the means to fulfill it. I, I truly believe that. And I think... People who are just about average, I think Eckhart said that, William Eckhart, I think he, he said people who are just about average probably make for the best traders. So if you're above average, then I'm sorry, you know, it's going to be a little harder for you. But if you don't have a lot of money, I can almost guarantee you, I can't guarantee much in this business, but I can guarantee you that if you go out and try to trade that money, you're going to lose it. For many of the aforementioned reasons, I have a client once, and, and we go back and forth quite a bit and help him out quite a bit. And years ago, he said, yeah, you got to reach a point where you sing like you don't need the money. And I like that, and I've been quoting him on that quite a bit. So what I would suggest you do, and again, it doesn't have to be my stuff, although I'm pretty passionate about what I do, and I believe in what I do, and I think there's a lot of shit out there, pardon my French. As my French friend says, hey, that's English. Um, there's a lot of crap out there, so separate the wheat from the chaff. You know, and obviously on my site, start for free. Read read 500 and something blog posts that I put out there. Watch the 1,500 videos, free videos that I put out there. And then after you do all that, then start spending a little money, what little you have, on some education. Or if you want to speed up the process, this whole webinar here is talking about time. If you don't have that much time, then start, then take what money you do have and buy a course or get on a service and watch the service, okay? If you don't have the money, get on a service. You could also get on a service delayed for free. So I put a lot out there for free so you could get out, get up and get started if you don't have a lot of money. But I would suggest instead of putting that money into the markets and losing it, I would spend it on education. And I'm a big believer of that. Now, once you do have a viable methodology, you're going to have to give yourself time to experience a variety of conditions. And the problem that I often see with a lot of people is that whatever they experience, they think it will always be that way. It's a permanent income hypothesis. The people who started in 1999, 
and absolutely printing money on a long side, think it will always be that way. What's interesting is I had some people start with me in 2008. It was pretty ironic, or late 2007. And their first trades were actually in the short side. Rarely have I ever seen anyone start trading and just start shorting because that's a little bit more advanced type of things. And we went through 2008. And they're like, this short side thing is phenomenal. Not only am I making money, but I'm making money on the money in my account. You know, interest rates weren't high, that high back then, but they were making a little money. And they're like, this is the greatest thing since sliced bread. Well, what happened after 2009, after March of 2009, obviously the market started going up. And they had a hard time because they're still shorting the market. They're still fighting the last battle. And uh, maybe write that down. I think that's a big problem that a lot of us have. We still fight the last battle. I, I personally, in 1999, when 2000 rolled around, I think I was still fighting the last battle, trying to hold on to some of those big winners, even though they've obviously turned the corner and try to put on new longs, even though the market has turned the corner. So you have to live through a few of these cycles to say, oh, we're in a bear market. Oh, we're in a bull market. Oh, you know what? Maybe we're just in a choppy market. Now, you're going to have to realize that once you have a methodology, you have to know how you're going to react to that methodology in a bull market, in a bear market, and in a sideways market. In a sideways market, you wonder if you're ever going to make a dime or there is or if there's ever going to be an opportunity. And that's a tough thing to do. And again, you put the self-imposed constraint on yourself, a, a time frame. You would never say, I want to be a doctor this week, start this week, and by next Monday be a doctor, or overnight, as I said earlier. You would obviously say, okay, I, I've got to get my undergraduate degree. I've got to go to med school. I mean, just a tremendous amount of planning and a tremendous amount of things that go into it. And... In the trading, you're going to need that experience, and you're going to know what it's like to have the drawdown, like the gentleman talked about earlier with the with the 50% drawdown system. Can you live through that? I don't know. You won't know until you actually live through it. So whenever I reach a stalemate with, with somebody, because I simply just don't have the time, number one, but number two, it's like obviously it's it's would take unlimited time to try to convince someone. So I just say go out and trade that for – three or four years and get back with me. And in the last 20 years, and let me let me do my math right to make sure. Yeah, closing in on 20 years, uh, I, I started publicly somewhere a little bit after 1995. I think I registered as a CTA in 1995 or 1994. And then I became, maybe 98, I started publishing commentary. But in the last, let's just say 15, 16 years, no one has ever emailed me back after me kind of criticizing the system. People were selling S&P future options. Good Lord, what a what a crazy way to have a very brilliant but brief career. So somebody, nobody's ever emailed me back. And then you're going to have to actually experience the real trades to know how you're going to react in real time. And can you follow your plan? I don't know. You won't know until you actually get in there and try to follow it, good, bad, and indifferent. Now, I'm not a big sports fan, although as I wrote in a column last year, occasionally you will find me up in the nosebleed section of the Saints game. I catch a game or two once a year. But other than that, I really don't know a lot about sports. So I actually had a little research on the fat pitch. And from my research, it says that a professional ball player, when that fat pitch comes along, it's like a surreal moment where that, that baseball looks more like a cabbage ball or like a basketball coming at you. It's that perfect pitch for the hitter, at least, to where it's just it's there. And if you're swinging at anything less, then you're taking a big chance. So you have to be willing to wait for that fat pitch. Now, what does that mean? Okay. 
let's say you found a possible setup. Now we're getting back to that counterfeit currency thing, you know? Is, does this look like something that, that's worked really well in the past? Have you exhausted all possibilities? Seriously, have you seriously exhausted all of the possibilities? I look at two to 3,000 stocks every night, so I know what's out there. I know what's available. And you need to ask yourself, is there nothing better out there? And then the question is, really, did you really look at all these other stocks? And if the sector, and ideally the market going in the same direction too, but let's say the sector's going in the same direction, you got the confirmation. Are there other stocks within the sector that are also confirming? Ideally, you want as many pieces to, uh, to fit as possible. And if the pieces all do fit, then depending on your sexual preference, go out and look for some sexy brothers and sexy sisters within that sector. Is there something you like even better? And if you still think you have the mother of all setups, then by all means, take it, okay? Now, you have to frame everything and the uh, the ban on a 401k tour, not the fat, angry white man, Rush, once saying, if you choose not to decide, you still have made a choice. And you need to weigh all your options and then doing nothing, okay, not doing anything, needs to be considered as a choice. I, I love the way Jimmy Rogers, I probably say this almost every week, Jimmy Rogers and Market Wizard said, I wait until there's money lying in the corner. And then all I have to do is walk over and pick it up. In the meantime, I do nothing. And that's how you have to be. Just make sure you think you have the best possible setup. And I was talking with one of you guys last week. We had a really good conversation. And and I was explaining. I said, you know, it's funny. The longer I'm at this, you would think it would be just the opposite. But the longer you're in this career, the less and less trades you will make. And it's just the opposite of what you think because you you learn what works and what doesn't. You learn to wait, and time is no longer your enemy. And I think Livermore once said it best, while you're just sitting and waiting, not doing anything, all the people that are fired to get out, I'm paraphrasing here, obviously, and they're building the base for your next venture. What's happening with the overall market right now? Let's just take a look at the P's, okay? The S&P 500 margin call, S&P 500 hasn't done a whole lot in a long, long time on a net-net basis. You can go back nearly a year or so. And in the Russell 2000, you can go back two years or more. So there's a lot of people that are jockeying for position. And they're building that base almost literally, okay? Take a look at, like, the oil stocks. They went down in a base for months and months and months and months and months. Same thing for the metals and mining. We're going to talk about those in a few minutes when we pull the charts up. So everybody that's in there fighting it out during that chop, it's grinding down the people who would sell as soon as the market begins to take off because they're looking to get out of break even. Okay, It's wearing those people out. It's grinding those people down. Unfortunately, people die. Unfortunately, people get divorced and they're forced to sell their stocks because they're getting divorced. Remember, as I often preach, people sell stocks for a variety of reasons that have nothing to do with the markets. So all that supply helps to work its way through the system. But everybody who's trading during that range is helping to build the base, in this case, literally for your next venture. So... Sometimes you just have to wait. And like Tom Petty said, the waiting is the hardest part. I wrote this last Friday, and I like it. <laughs> if, I had to choose, if I had a choice for a protege, I'd choose someone who is patient over someone who is smart any day. The patient waits for an opportunity. And once the patient finds that opportunity, they let things unfold. The people who are quote-unquote smart – We'll try to force something to happen and we'll reason why a position should not be seen to its fruition. And that was written a couple days ago 
or last Friday, I should say. Now, getting back to, again, last week, just want to kind of dovetail back in. And this is where you want to see that position to its fruition. You want to not only plan your trade. That's easy. Anybody can do that, okay? But following that plan, like Tyson said, everybody's got a plan. It's like a punch in the face. This is the hard part. And as I wrote extensively last week, just for your next trade, I want you to be patient. And before you take that trade, I want you to obsess. I want you to obsess before you get into the trade and then afterwards. And by obsessing, everything I said earlier, and make sure that the trend is either a very obvious emerging trend, like we're seeing in the energies and metals and mining right now, gold, or it's a solid trend and that trend's accelerating, ideally. And ideally, you want that trend to be persisting, meaning that the stock tends to go up day after day after day after day. There's obviously demand that's happening. It does not chop around, does not look like electric cardiogram. Again, I find myself saying, read that column from last Friday. It's current on my website. I'll put up a new one tomorrow, likely. But read that one. That's I think that's one of my better ones, if I say so myself. And then there's also... Uh, a list of suggested reading on there too. I don't want to be too self-promoting here, but I think it was pretty good. So once you do think you really have something, then just follow the plan. And you only have to do that on your next trade. And that's what the whole column was about. Prove to yourself that you could do it on one trade. You could not be successful until you make one successful trade. And again, I was talking to one of you guys last week. I was Great talking with a lot of you. Thanks for all the feedback. And we were talking a lot about the process. And this gentleman was an actual surgeon that does operate on people. And I asked him, I said, do you wing it in your surgery like you wing it in the markets? And he's like, no. I said, well, is it is it a process? And he does absolutely. So trading is more of a process-oriented thing. But it's also like a lot of other things in life too. There's a procedure and a process to go through surgery. There's a procedure and a process to take a trade. Now we're not splitting the atom of the trade or it's not rocket surgery, but you need to follow that plan. And psychologically, that could be tough. Everybody has a plan again until they get punched in the face. Now, in spite of all my preaching and teaching and beating the dead horse and flattening the bed horse, dead horse, what happens? Well, again, like I wrote last week in the column, I lay out the entire plan. And in this particular case, what did the plan have? Take partial profits at seven. What happened? Stocks hit seven. Next day, right around here, get an email. Hey, Dave. Stock hit seven yesterday. You said to take partial profits. What should I have done? Um, take partial profits. <laughs> but instead, you let the market go against you and you begin to stress out. And a lot of people quit long before then. A lot of people don't even allow the position to work. As soon as it goes sideways for a few days, they're out. And this is especially true with a non-commodity stock. People will say, Dave. Stock's going sideways, market's going straight up. So what? So what? Well, it's not acting right. Well, so what? Follow your plan. If it's not acting right, then the stop will take you out. The stop becomes your passive decision, okay? You have to make your decisions passive ones and not active ones. Once you put a trade on, there's not a whole lot to do. What you should be doing is you should be looking for your next opportunity. Positions, for the most part, will take care of themselves. Every now and then a little discretion is necessary. Don't get me wrong, and I preach about that a lot. But you have to be successful at at least following the original plan mechanically before you can even think about adding on a discretion. So that's lesson number two or lesson 401 or 501, whatever the course number may be. 
But initially, you have to focus on having the discipline to follow your method. So again, regardless of my planning and laying everything out, I get questions the next day. Dave, should we just exit? It's it's going flat. Dave, should we why why should we give up these open profits? Well, because if you don't let the stock retrace, and this might be a good example, if you don't let it go against you a little bit, and then hopefully turn back up, you'll never catch this if it does turn back up. If you get stopped out, so what? I know, easier said than done. I'm not holier than now when it comes to not getting excited we're humans okay we're going to be emotional i drop a lot of f-bombs okay i try to drop fewer and fewer because it's not good for me but i get upset we all get upset okay but you have to learn how to move on you can't get pissed off and have that stress you out so you need to see that position as i wrote last week to its fruition just follow the plan Okay, right now the stop's here. What do you do? Nothing. What if it hits a stop? What do you do? Well, you get out. Okay. It's not that complicated. It's not that difficult. I never said it was easy. Now, again, like I said last week, and I don't want to beat the dead horse too much, but I just want to kind of throw this out there one more time. And this this is the process thing, and, and I think the process thing is probably fodder for a complete column or even a complete book in and of itself. So I did want to make sure I covered the process part. So make sure you give yourself some time to reflect upon what you've done. And I think it was Linda Rasky once talked about delivered practice. I think she plays uh, piano. And the way she got better at it, or good at it, I should say, is through deliberate practice. And that goes for trading or surgery or repairing automatic transmissions or training dogs or whatever your career may be. So deliberate practice and trading is, for me, it's a couple of things. One, it's when you're looking at those charts, Not don't just kind of halfway go through the charts with your eyes closed. Pay attention to each and every chart. Doesn't mean you have to obsess and spend 10 minutes on each chart. I mean, sometimes I might spend less than a second on a chart. But I'm looking at them day after day after day, and I begin to recognize reoccurring patterns, and I recognize the stock from yesterday because I just looked at it yesterday. And then the way my scans run, I run through the whole database once, and then I run the scans again, so that way I've seen the I've seen the same stock twice. But when you do, but when you actually do take a trade, the trade is over with. I always go back and look at that trade in perfect hindsight. And as I think I wrote last week, a lot of times, at least early in my career, I would say, "What the hell was I thinking?" And the more you do that, the more you realize that you've got to get a little bit better in your stock selection, your stock picking, your market selection if you're trading other markets. But if you honestly do a post-mortem on every trade and you do find yourself saying what the hell I was thinking, then I think you're going to get into better trades because you don't want to have more and more losing trades. Now, the process versus the end result can be a tough thing because the market will teach you. And I don't go too far into this because we talked about it a lot last week. Watch last week's recording. Go to my website slash videos, daylander.com slash videos, and then it's the first one up there. It'll be the second one as soon as I put this one up today. But watch that video where, and it's a reoccurring theme, I talk about the market being a bad teacher. You could do a lot of bad things in the market, and the market will reward you, okay? You could do bad things, and the market could reward you for years and giving you that false sense of confidence. You could sell options and sell a lot of options and make a lot of money, make a lot of consistent money, so-called income. And that's great as long as you quit before you blow up, okay? 
before that so-called black swan shows up. So just remember that the market could be a really bad teacher. If you do make money on a trade and you did something stupid, it's not it's not you that should take credit for that. You just you should you should honestly tell yourself, I got lucky and I won't be stupid enough to do that again. And it's interesting that the psychologist, and I don't know who to credit for this, it might be Montier or, or um, I don't know if it's it's a uh, Thaler or Montier. One of those guys said that we have an innate ability, not an innate ability. What's a, what's a better word for that? We tend to, for lack of the the grand eloquent term, we tend to credit ourselves as being skillful and smart when things go wrong and being unlucky. When things, I'm sorry, let me back that up. <laughs> we, when things go right, we tend to see it as our skills. When things go wrong, we, we tend to say, see it as being unlucky. And it's hard. You have to do a lot of introspection. You have to really look within and say, well, I made a lot of money in this trade, but I did something stupid. I should not have done that. Okay. All right, uh, here's a delayed service. Um, I don't know how to put links in here. Maybe I could throw it in the chat window. I don't know if that'll work or not. Uh, but just go to my website. And you know what? The easiest way to get there would be to go to uh, Getting Started, which is right up on the homepage. And I'll show you real quick because a lot of people um, – Are always asking. The easiest way to get to the delayed service. The problem is I keep wanting to put more and more stuff on my homepage, and then my homepage will start looking like that messy website that I used to have. But just go to uh, Let's Get Started, and then right here is the delayed service. That's the easiest way to get to it. Okay. So I know I went off on a lot of tangents, but the bottom line is just remember, again, the market can reward bad behavior. Give yourself time to learn. Give yourself time to experience a variety of conditions. Don't put these self-imposed deadlines on yourself. You would never do that in any other career, so don't do it in trading. All right, lots of good thoughts and questions coming in. Thank you, guys. Same thing with supporting candidates and sports teams. Okay, hang on. Uncanny ability. Same thing with supporting. Uh, okay, Kay, what's what? Where are you going with that? You lost me for a second. Dathan says, looking forward to today's webinar. Hey, well, glad you're here. Recording. Okay, cool. Yeah, I'll get it up as soon as I get uh, as soon as we get done. I'll start uh, processing it. If the trend accelerates, when does it become ex too extended to buy? Well, okay, that's interesting. You know, I've been getting a lot of because these uh, a lot of these commodity-related stocks, especially the cheap ones, the volatility has been absolutely nuts. And I'm getting a lot of questions on stocks, and I can't think of one off the top of my head. We could maybe find one in a little while, but some of these stocks have bottomed out, and then they've done this. Well, this run here is like two to four hundred percent over several bars. No kidding. And then if you look at the HV up here, it's like two hundred. Okay. So that's probably too much. That's what I call a bottle rocket. A bottle rocket, which I talked about in the stock selection course, is when a stock just goes straight up and it's like it's going forever. But if you've ever, if you're a redneck like me, and you've ever played with fireworks, a bottle rocket, when you light it, it, it's pretty exciting, but it fizzles out really quick. It goes straight up, then, you know, it's done. Well, you're going to find a lot of these stocks, which are called bottle rockets, they'll go straight up, but then they'll go straight back down, okay? 
So first and foremost, if you're in a stock that goes up two or three hundred percent over a few days, then obviously you need to avoid that stock as far as trading. Now your question is, if you're playing an accelerated trend, let's say you got a trend that looks like this, and then it begins to accelerate higher like this, okay? Well, depending on the magnitude of this move, you want to see a pretty serious knockout like CENX, which we talked about a few days ago. Uh, ran up nicely and then it started pulling back and people keep asking me, Hey Dave, can I get in now? Can I get in now? I missed the first trade or I want to do an add on trade. And it's like, well, based on the, on the magnitude of the rhyme, it ran up so much that you need to make sure you're waiting for a bit of a decent type of move lower. Now remember nothing, nothing is magical about the way I approach markets and the way you should approach markets. Realize that technical analysis, the legitimate technical analysis, is reading the emotions of the market. So, for instance, like my trend knockout pattern, one of the greatest patterns, I think, when it comes to at least explaining it on a psychological basis because it just makes so much sense. So you've got a market in a trend, ideally an accelerated trend like we just talked about, and then bam, you have a big knockout move. Well, anybody who bought above this level is at a loss. Anybody who bought back here is beginning to think, hmm, I'm losing open profits. Should I bail out or not? So you want to make sure some people have been knocked out of the market you also want to make sure some eager shorts up here are thinking about shorting the market because this overextended market has begun to sell off. So there has to be some psychology behind the pattern, behind every pattern and reasoning. You know, somebody emailed me, well, Dave, isn't this stock a wedge and this and all this other stuff and throwing out all this technical analysis? Well, some of those things make sense. But not all of those things necessarily make sense. I have to be able to wrap my head around it. So if their stock is in an if the stock is an accelerated trend, is it too extended to buy? Well, how deep is the pullback? So if a stock goes straight up, as long as this pullback is fairly deep, then you know that enough people have been knocked out of the trend, enough shorts have been sucked into the trend to hopefully, and there's that word, hope, but hopefully make trading it worthwhile. So the sharper the trend, the deeper the pullback will have to be. You don't want to, I mean, unless we're in a rip-roaring bull market, but if the market's going straight up, you don't want to get in on like the so-called bull flag. You don't want to try to get in after a tiny, tiny little bit of correction. You want to make sure from a psychological standpoint that some serious people have been knocked out of the market before you think about getting in. Okay. Yeah, uh, Dathan was asking me about EPE. We'll take a look at that in just one second. That's one of those cases where uh, what I call a bottle rocket. Um, by the way, just FYI, I've been kind of noodling with the website a little bit, as you know. And it's a work in progress, but it's getting there, I, I, I think. And then the videos are going to be right here. So, like, right after I get done with this presentation, I'll start processing. It takes about an hour to process and an hour to upload. So it takes a few hours to get them up, but it will show up under the video page. So obviously you got a menu up here and then the latest content, the easiest way to get to it, just scroll down to the bottom. This is the podcast. This is the column we were just talking about quite a bit. And this is my latest week of charts. Now you also want to uh, check the videos too for the latest there okay all right let's hop into the charts okay phil says you have survivorship bias in people how long did it take you to become a successful pilot oh i don't know i think you know i was thinking about that yesterday when i was doing a little bit of uh pre-writing for tomorrow's column and i i just put a couple things down just in case I decided to use them. But Gladwell says that an overnight success, and I'm not sure if it's him directly who said this, but it's been said that an overnight success takes about 
10 years. So if you listen to some of these motivational speakers, they'll talk about people who are successful, but they'll also talk about how hard they worked. And Gladwell, I think it was in Outliers, read everything by Gladwell. He's my favorite author. But in Outliers, he talked about how, again, it takes about 10,000 hours to become successful. And he used the Beatles as a case study, as one of his case studies. And the Beatles were in these nightclubs at a very young age that stayed open all night. And they ran out of songs to play, so they would just start playing all kinds of music. And that's why if you listen to a Beatles song, sometimes it's like an oompa pa in the middle of the song. That's kind of weird for a pop song. But that's how they got good. They practiced. So I think an overnight success at any field takes about 10,000 hours. I firmly believe I could take the steepness out of the learning curve. There was a quote that I had um, in a column. Let me see if I can find it real quick. I would rather have someone with an open mind who's willing to learn than someone who's smart any day. Let me see if I can find what I was talking about. The most difficult subjects can be explained to the most dim-witted man. It's hard to get here. The most difficult subjects can be explained to the most dim-witted. If he has not formed any idea of them already, but the simplest thing cannot be made clear to the most intelligent man if he is firmly persuaded that he knows already without a shadow of a doubt. And that's Tolstoy who said that. So I would rather somebody with an open mind that's more of a sponge than someone who's already set in their ways when it comes to learning. So I think that if you could forget about everything you know, <laughs> and then start from scratch and keep it really simple, I think you could do quite well. And I think that you can learn fairly quickly. But what makes it tough is the smarter people, and I like to pick on doctors just because I have a lot of doctors or clients who struggle, because they're so damn smart, they're always trying to get in early. They're always trying to exit early. They're always trying to beat the system. They're always trying to trade when there's not a whole lot of opportunities. Like I have one set up on the service. Dave, I'm in these seven stocks. How'd you get seven stocks? Well, you had them on your landry list. Well, I also said, hey, let's just not get too crazy in here. Let's just go after this one, and that's it. So if you have someone who's not very smart, at least regarding the markets, and they're willing to believe in what they see and not in what they believe, then they can be successful. I have a... Uh, my teenage daughter's in a stock picking contest. I heard one of her friends have asked me for help. And I'm just going to give them a really simple system. And, and, and I'm just going to tell them to buy stocks at new highs. And I'd be willing to bet they're going to do okay. I'd be willing to bet they're going to beat the rest of their class. This, this happened. It's a story I often tell about a guy who was flunking his course and he came over here. And I tried to teach him. And he says, he looks at his watch. He goes, I only got about another, whatever, 10 minutes. I'm like, okay, forget about everything I just told you. Just buy a stock when it makes new highs. And he goes, well, sometimes we have to trade. I said, all right. When, when the teacher makes you trade, sell any stock that's at a loss or sell the smallest gainer and then replace it with a stock that's making new highs. So something really simple can work. I'm not saying you rush out and do that tomorrow. It's a little bit more to it than that. I mean, if you did a stock making contest, by all means, I think you'll do fine doing that. But it does take some time. But a lot of that time is going to be spent wasted trying to outsmart the system, trying to outsmart the markets. And if you could somehow get rid of that time, then I think your your learning curve, the steepness of your learning curve will come way out. I kind of went on and on on that, but okay. My problem is how much overhead is too much? By nature, bow tie will have overhead. Well, the bow tie won't always have overhead, but I hear what you're saying. And again, this is something that we went into a lot of detail in and a stock selection course. Let me see if I could sum it up as quickly as possible. So Susan's saying, okay, you got a market that looks like this, and it's got some overhead supply. So again, 
Everything we do is, has a psychological basis. What's happening during this range, you have a lot of people who likely have owned the stock. If I don't use volume by price, but if you ever get around to playing with it, it's going to look something like this. And that's the reason why I don't really use it that much or haven't used it in years. I just kind of experimented with it a little bit. Is because it just basically shows you what's already there in a the chart. It's it's kind of a, an illustrator, not an indicator. But say you do have your bow tie down here, and you've got your little pullback. You're ready to go. Well, there's a couple things you need to ask yourself. How far above the market is the overhead supply? Okay. If it's a hundred percent above the market, then if I made 100% on the trade before it ran into trouble, I'm okay with that. That's okay. How wide is this overhead supply? Okay. The longer this is in length, the bigger the problem it's going to be. How far back is this overhead supply? Okay. If it's a year ago and you've got a pretty serious base way down here, like I said earlier, a lot of that supply has probably already worked its way through the market. Again, people die, people get divorced and have to sell half of their stuff, which often includes some stocks, okay? So what's the magnitude of this and length? How far away is it from price? How long ago was it? And those are just a few things you need to ask yourself when it comes to the overhead supply. So start with that. Thanks, Dave. Great to be here today. Got to leave early. Hey, no problem. Ciao. If you follow the market almost perfectly, would you expect your return in a bull market and in a bear market maybe over the last 10 to 15 years by shorting is just as profitable as longs? No, uh, shorting is not just as profitable as longs. Uh, in a market like 2008, I don't have it in front of me right now, but I think it was like low double digit returns, positive returns, as opposed to a negative 40% for the market. So the relative basis, it absolutely printed money. Um, in a bull market, it absolutely prints money, okay? In a choppy market, it's hard to keep your head above uh, the water. Somebody asked me what, what was my two worst years, and I don't actually publish the official results, but I do have some uh, YouTubes out there showing the, the discretionary portfolio. But the two worst years, I think, were like 2011, where the market was all over the place, but end of the year up like eight nine percent. That was one of the the, the bigger. Uh, you know, less less than stellar performances that I remember. So if a market's doing this or a market's doing this, okay, with hopefully a little transition in between, then it does, it does pretty good. If it's doing this, not so good. But here's the thing about the equity curve. The equity curve is going to look like this, and then when you hit that chop, it's going to start looking like this. And then guess what? Right around here, there's no trade. So it'll start looking like this. It'll flatten out, okay? because we're not trying to make something happen during that market. And if this market takes off or if this market sells off hard, the equity curve will start doing this again. So take a look at that YouTube and you can find it under uh, videos on my website. I'll show you real quick. Okay, while we're doing that, let's take another question. Ask Ackman. Who's Ackman? Okay. To your point, oh, oh, to your point on how we react to failure and success. Okay, is it is it Ackman that, that wrote about that? When just in case I, I I botched that up, which I think I did, we credit ourselves with success because we were smart when things, when the end result works, okay? We see failure as being unlucky, okay? Yet we reproduced, we produced both of these results. So if you do come to video, just FYI, um, somewhere in here, right here, this one right here, this one has a, um, and I need to update it. It's a little dated, but you'll see 
and looking at it, you'll see that equity curve thing that is talked about. So choppy markets are the enemy and whipsaws are the enemy of a trend following system. Like Greg Morris says, whipsaws are frustrating, bear markets are devastating. You could survive frustration. You can't survive devastation. So you will get whipsawed out every now and then, and then the market will turn right back around. The good news is if you're process oriented, then you're like, damn it, I got whipsawed a little bit but you move on. But if you let the market teach you the wrong thing, then what happens? You hold on through the whipsaws and then eventually you get that bear market. And that's what's going to happen. To, not to get too far sidetracked, imagine me going off on a tangent, but that's what's going to happen to a lot of people who've been buying stocks since 2009. When, not if, when this market rolls over. Now, this market might go off to make new highs. That might that could be the absolute worst thing in the world for these people. They'll say, oh, yeah, once again, I didn't let the market take me out. I'm so smart. The people that tell people, oh, hang in there for the long term, you know, which is bullshit, okay? Markets go up and markets go down. I'm working on a little intro to trading series or video or course, however you want to look at it. And I'm going to talk about the same exact things I, I said in the Layman's Guide to Trading Stocks. I'm going to pull stock charts straight out of that. A market could go 25 years or more without making new highs. And even in more recent times, we've had periods of over a decade where a market is actually losing money. Okay, don't believe me? Go look at the charts. So you got to be careful not to get sucked into that permanent income hypothesis. And again, everything we do is based on the psychology of the market. So when this market really does begin to crack, there's going to be a lot of people who are hurting pups. Dave, do you always buy uptrending stocks after they pull back? Yeah, I don't just jump in. Now, I know I don't want to confuse the issue too much. If you're in a stock picking contest and you don't, you got 10 minutes to learn how to trade and you're more interested in playing with your phone and FaceTiming your friends and whatever they're doing now, taking photos or whatever they're called, then, yeah, just just buy stocks where they make new highs. If you're interested, it, so that will help you win a contest short term. But longer, t unless you're buying a hundred stocks, unless you're running a, you know, if I was tomorrow, if somebody wanted me to run a, a large fund and I didn't have time to run the large fund, I would just buy stocks making new highs. It, it, ironically, I talked a lot about these things and it's it's so funny. You get so so many good things out of Greg Morris. And at least for me, it just gives me the confirmation that what I'm doing and what I'm discovered makes sense. He's He actually wrote, uh, there's a list of, there's a list of stocks you should buy, and it's published every day in the newspaper. It's called the New Highs List. But if you're going to follow a methodology longer term and you and you don't have the luxury of running a big, huge fund where you could just rush out and buy everything that's making new highs, or if you're not running a paper stock contest like my daughter's in now and her friend, which if they ever, you know, it's they're like a week into it now and they haven't come to me yet. To uh, actually, they're too busy doing other things. But whenever they get around to coming to me, that's what I'm going to teach them. So yeah, you could just buy new highs if you want to stick with the methodology longer term. Then you actually have to wait for a pullback. Do I always buy pullbacks? It depends. It depends on a lot of things. It depends on the market conditions. Okay, uh, what's the market doing um, right now? I'm buying emerging trends as they pull back. It, albeit even slightly, these energy stocks, these metals and mining. We'll take a look at them in just one second. So I don't necessarily always buy stocks when they pull back. There's been some pullbacks lately in stocks in general that I've completely ignored. I put them on the list to show people, hey, I'm doing my homework. This is what I found. But with the market going mostly sideways and most sectors sideways or retracing at best, then I'm having a hard time rushing out and buying those stocks. Okay. So it all depends on, on the pullback. But 95% of everything that I do is based on a pullback. Now, with the emerging trends, it's only a slight pullback. And the reason it's only a slight pullback in emerging trends 
is because a lot of people are waiting for something more or something bigger or waiting for that uh, deeper pullback. So let's say you got a stock kind of bottoms out, begins to rally a little bit. I've kind of purposely drawn it as a cup and handle because a lot of times your bow ties will set up like a cup and handle. But it could also be a first thrust, which is a little bit sharper like this. And I'm looking to get in at that little tiny bit of a correction. And the reason is, if I wait for a deeper correction, that may never come. And my favorite ones just have a little tiny correction and take off. Now, just the opposite. If a stock's in a longer term extended trend, then I want a nice deep correction to knock some people out. This is trend resumption. Trend resumption. Okay, this is trend transition or emerging trends. Two different things. I'm going to talk about emerging trends later today for our London Investment Week, round the clock trader. So come to that if you have time. So two different things. Depends on the market. Right now, I'm not very excited about trend resumption patterns. I'm more excited about trend transition patterns. All right, Ray says, Dave, on the drawing you showed earlier that showed entry stop and initial target, I noticed that the buy point indicated was two or three bars after the breakout from the flag. Do you wait for an extra number of bars? Well, not necessarily an extra number of bars. This is what Ray is, is asking. Ray's saying, hey, you didn't buy like right above the high. So technically the, the buy would have been right here on this particular day. Okay. And – our actual entry was here. Now, this wasn't because this I carried this entry over necessarily. It's because, okay, I saw this set up, and I was like, well, and I have to go back and look at what day I, I put it on first. But, yes, on the following day here, you would have bought early, but I would have given that a little wiggle room too. What I'm doing is I'm giving the, the position a little bit of wiggle room to try to avoid a false move. So I'm not necessarily looking back – and saying I want it above the two-bar high, the three-bar high, the four-bar high. I just want it far enough above the market. Okay, here's the market here. I'm not going to put it in right here, although in this case, obviously, it worked. And with emerging trade patterns, you can be a little bit more aggressive on your entries. Um, Phil, you, Phil and I were going back and forth on that a while back, and Phil's a little bit more aggressive than I am when it comes to entering the emerging trends. And he's got a point, especially if the HV is really high. But ideally, you want to give it some wiggle room to help avoid getting getting uh, triggered into a bad trade, okay? So it's not necessarily two or three bars. You're welcome. All right, good. You got that. IBD's new high-low list is, is has a title. You can find winners in IBD. Oh, really? IBD's new high slash low list has a title. You can find winners in IBD's new high list. I believe that. Appropriate stops in a choppy market. Well, uh, base, everything is based on the volatility of individual stock. You'll notice that this stock, percentage-wise, had a huge stop, okay? But that's what it calls for. The HV was huge on it, okay? Sorry, but the Ackham Hedge Fund guys down 50% two years knows it all. Knows it all, okay. Well, if... Uh, Susan say uh, Bill Bill's Ackham's hedge fund is down 50%. Now, if they're trading some methodology that does have some sort of tremendous drawdown like that, then that's fine. But that's not my cup of tea. Now, Warren Buffett has 50% drawdowns. And I don't know why he gets a pass. I, you know, maybe I live in a glass house. I shouldn't throw stones. Maybe I need to wait until I've made a million dollars, a million billion. Maybe I need to wait until I made a billion before I could criticize. It's easy to criticize from the outside. But my question is, if you drew down 50%, who's to say that you can't draw down even further? There's an old saying, and people who believe it are successful and people who don't, they don't know what hit them. But there's an old saying that your biggest drawdown is always in front of you. I told it to a systems guy once, and he got mad at me, almost like beginning to raise his voice and stuff. So I just kind of backed off like, oh, well, whatever. Experience is the best teacher is the way I see it. <laughs> Reminds me of um, chafed nipples. I uh, 
in high school, I was uh, had a friend who was a few years older than me, and we were water skiing. And there were some little kids playing on a big piece of uh, foam that had floated off from a pipeline. If you guys been around pipelines, they uh, they float these big pipelines out in the marsh with these huge pieces of styrofoam. And one of them broken free, I guess, in a storm or whatever. And these kids were climbing on it and rubbing all over this foam and flipping around and all. And so I picked up my buddy out the water and I took my boat and I started going over to these kids. He's like, what the hell are you doing? I said, dude, it's like, I remember when I was a kid, I used to buy these cheap surfboards at the, at the store, at the beach. And you would, it would rub against your belly all day and your nipples would get chafed and your belly would get chafed to where you couldn't even sleep that night because it hurt so bad and the sheets couldn't even touch. I said, I'm going to go tell those kids, hey, you're going to be hurt in pups by tonight. And he grabbed the steering wheel. We weren't going fast. We are just kind of putting, puttering along. He grabbed the steering wheel and he turns it away. I'm like, what are you doing? And he looked at me and he said, Dave, experience is the best teacher. <laughs> So, so go trade your system. That's going to give you a 50% drawdown and learn your lesson. Okay. That's my talk about chafe nipple. Susan says, I'm being sarcastic. Oh, okay. Agrid thinks he knows it all. That's why you don't, that's why you don't get out when you should. Yeah. You know, and that's one thing that I say, and I probably say it too much. You know, my wife says I beat a dead horse. And it drives my girls nuts, which is a short trip, but that's another story altogether. I probably do say it too much, but he who fights and runs away lives to fight another day. Let me just show you something here. I mean, you know, I shouldn't pick on someone else, especially someone who's been so successful. But if you take, take a look at Berkshire, and it just so happens that he's, um, he's the first one that comes to mind. How do you spell it? Berkshire. Oh, here it is. Okay. You know, it's kind of interesting, too. I was reading an article about him not too long ago, and they're talking about he was selling puts. It's like, wait, this this guy selling puts? He's in the derivatives? So in 2009, fund went down 43%. Peak to trough, probably 50%. So you can't argue with the success longer term, but sooner or later, that 50% is going to be more than 50%, and that's hard to live through. So what did he do in a recent slide? Round numbers. Yep, like probably about 20% round numbers. And what happened? So did the market. All right, let's uh, keep the questions coming, and I'll, 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 I'll multi-process here, which is you're not supposed to do. We'll talk about the markets, and we'll answer some questions. And then now, uh, let's go ahead and open up for individual stocks, too. Yeah, let me let me cover this one first. Uh, Dathrin was asking me about EPE, and the reason I didn't like it um, as a potential setup was, like I said earlier, the HV. Look at the HV, 218. Okay, Dave, how high is too high? Well... I think the highest HV stock I've ever traded was a little uranium stock, and it was uh, like 150. But anytime you get over 100, like we do have a couple of over 100 in the portfolio right now, just know that you're in for a bumpy ride and make sure you adjust your stops accordingly. Now, if you look at what this stock did, let's just make a quick measurement on here. It went up over 300%. Over how many days? Well, the majority of the move was in over three days or four days. Let's just say three days. So nearly 300% in three days, that's a pretty massive move, and that's going to be hard to sustain. As I say quite often, I'd much rather get into a stock and have it bore me to death but gradually rise for the next 10 years and I'm pleasantly surprised as opposed to have it go straight up. And that's exciting. Don't get me wrong. That's that time thing, you know, rearing its ugly head. Hey, look how much money, how fast I'm making it. But unfortunately, those type of moves aren't sustainable. So just remember that very dangerous to take 
a trade like this. Yeah, it's worked out pretty good so far, but it's it's a very dangerous trade to be making. Okay. David, don't use, use volume in the indicator. EPE has had over 10 times the average daily volumes in surge, which indicate massive infrastructure institutional buying. Does that change your opinion? No. Does it change your opinion about EPE and the bow tie theory? No. I don't use volume. If you find a way to use it, then by all means use it. I don't want to get into a long discussion on that, but I don't use volume. The There's no way to properly calculate volume. The stock is optionable. You don't know how many options are on this stock. You don't know what the true volume is. You don't know if people are reporting volume correctly. Uh, there's, a, there's a whole bunch of trouble here. All right, Travis says, I'm having trouble here. I'm smart. Hey, Travis, how's it going, man? How do I let go of all the prior education I have to determine the appropriate stops? Well, to me, that's easy. Uh, an appropriate stop is what the market requires. So if a stock is bouncing around three and four and five points a day, then your stop has to be more than that, okay? This stock is bouncing around how much in a day? 70% in a day? So <laughs> if you have a stop much, much smaller than that, you're going to get stopped out by noise alone. If I had to say anything, err on the side of your stops being too loose, just the opposite of what everybody preaches. But adjust your share size accordingly. That little uranium stock I talked about earlier had an HV of 150-something, whatever it was. I forget. Um, I think it was like URRE, one of those stocks. We had a pretty big stop on that. You look at some of the stops like on CENX, there's a huge stop on that. I don't have it. It's, it's in the column. I'll have to find the... Uh, the column, but I think if you look at the stop on that, it was ridiculous percentage wise, but you adjust the share size down accordingly. So I bought the last few bars. Also, I bought how much the stock has moved. Also, how deep is a retrace? Sometimes you get a really nice deep retrace, and then your stop could be a little tighter. And that's something that we talked a lot about if memory serves in stock selection webinar. But yeah, let's see. Uh, CENX right here. 523.40. 180. So that's a 180 stop. But Dave, that's stupid. That's ridiculous. Well, I'm sorry, but that's what it recalls for, okay? That's a 33% stop. And we also had a 33% profit target. There it is right here. Okay, profit target was 33%, stop was 33%, okay? From there to there, 33%, from there to there, 33%. That's what it called for, okay? How to determine that? Well, look at the range. Look at the range on this, this bar here, okay? Look at the move from the low up to here, okay? It's almost, you start measuring that, it gets pretty big pretty quick. So, what was that move from the low? And then it's much bigger because the high. So that's a 70 something percent move. So that's a pretty that's a pretty serious move. So that's gonna require a fairly loose stop. Well, if you squint your eyes, the stop was right here. It doesn't look that far away, does it? Okay. But if you look at the percentage, oh my god, I can't I can't use a 33% stop. Well, that's what it calls for. There's a popular method that uses an eight percent stop. I guarantee you, you'll be stopped out of the stock in no time. I mean, what was the drawdown just right here? 11%, okay? So you got stopped. You probably got stopped at a stock a long time ago. That's what it calls for. And then it's run from here to here, hit the private target. It's 50%, okay? But it calls for a wide stop. So to me, it's easy. You just eyeball a stock. Now, a lot of people say, Dave, do you use average true range? Well, I think if you boiled it all down, I'm probably using the average true range. Craig says, volume, try to wrap your head around this. The low end estimate of derivatives is $630 trillion. And the upper, upper end is $1.2 quadrillion. Volume is meaningless. Amen, Craig. Amen. 
Okay, Phil says, I bought a rocket. I have a scan that looks for stocks up to 100% within eight weeks. EP is one of them. They're currently 133 results in the scan, normally 10 to 30. Yeah, that's kind of a fun scan to run, Phil. Um, I need to make a note to uh, take a look at that. That's kind of interesting. Phil scan. Let me make a note. Phil scan. I'll play with that, see what I come up with. Robert said, if you were lucky enough to get a 200% or, of course, a giant move is not sustainable, 3% jump in a day, would you sell at least half of the position immediately? Well, if you caught such a big move, there's a good chance, there's a better than average chance that you would hit your initial profit target. So, yes, you would sell half. On the other half, it's going to be hard to hold on to. Okay, it's a good problem to have, but it'd be very hard, hard to hold on to. Just make sure your stop is at a point where at least you'll stop out of the profit. All right, keep the questions coming. Let me start. Uh, let's get through the market real quick so we make sure we get that covered. S&P 500. Boy, I tell you, can't argue with this guy lately, huh? Look how persistent this trend is. That's been a pretty persistent trend. Persistency is also mathematically equivalent to linear regression. If you want to draw a linear regression trend line, as I just did here, this is linear regression. This is just the, the eyeball trend line. And this is why, again, I tend to eyeball things. But mathematically, if you want to play with that, it's mathematically equivalent to linear regression. You back the chart out a little bit and draw your lines. Again, let's keep it stu uh, simple. <laughs> keep it simple, stupid. <laughs> I wrote about that in the column a while back. We were, I, was, I was with my wife picking on antique sinks and you married guy and you guys who aren't married are probably laughing at me you big pansy don't laugh you're married you'll do these kind of things anyway the woman said uh we couldn't find two matching ones so the woman said keep it simple and she kind of paused for a minute and she said stupid it's <laughs> like oh ye he used to say we didn't buy the sinks there anyway keep it simple stupid if if you didn't know anything about the markets and again if you don't know anything I'd rather teach you than somebody who knows a lot, okay? Where's the market? 2000. Where was the market? Beginning of 2015, 2000. Where was the market in 2014? 2000. So on a net net basis, we have made a whole lot of forward progress. So if you didn't know anything about markets, and again, welcome aboard. If you don't, I'll be happy to show you some very simple things draw you that big blue arrow and it's going sideways so that's from a trend following perspective there's no trend to follow there okay now if we take a look at a weekly chart the retrace so far if you just connect the high the all-time high to the recent low so far this is just a retrace rally now retrace rallies are tough because they punish the shorts spit them out, and then they suck into longs, or they keep the longs happy and complacent. So anybody who bought this market since 2009 is like, hey, market just goes up. I'm just going to hang on. Oh, tried to shake me out. Didn't shake me out. I don't know why I sound like Bill Clinton, but. <laughs> and sooner or later, they're going to get in a lot of trouble. So retrace rallies are really tough. Again, we still have this major bow tie sell signal working. What would it take to negate that? Well, remember, a major signal coming off of all-time highs, especially like on a weekly basis, stays in effect until the market, until and unless the market makes new highs. So I would keep that in the back of my mind. And the other question I'm getting asked a lot, Dave, you say it's overbought. How do you measure overbought? Well, you could eyeball it again, or you could just take a measurement. 11% in less than a month. 11% in less than a month. What did the stock market do in a whole year last year? Let's see. Last year, 2015, let's start at 1231. The close of 1231, New Year's Eve, to New Year's Eve, or January 1st even. Yeah, New Year's Eve, that's fine. 0.73%. So, in a whole year, it took a whole year for the market to do what? Go down three quarters of a percent. And just in less than a few weeks, it went up 11%. That's overbought. 
Now, 11% move at CENX, that, that probably already happened today, okay? <laughs> so it's all relative. It's kind of like incest. It's all relative. All right, let's take a look at the Rusty. The Rusty, I think, paints the true picture what's really going on. So let's take a look at a weekly Rusty real quick. The bow tie here, a little bit more obvious, a lot more obvious, I should say. Your trigger was here. It had a little bit of a retrace, but then it imploded and peaked the trough. The Rusty is down a little bit more than 25%. The media calls a bear market at 20%. The Russell is 2,000 stocks. This is what the average stock is doing. The average stock is still going down. So... That's why I'm having a hard time getting excited about the market. Yeah, shorter term, it's rallied up, pulled back a little bit. It might have another leg up in it. I don't know. But I'm not going to rush out and buy the Russell or rush out and buy another bunch of stocks, especially since, like Susan was asking about, it's got overhead supply right here. So people might be looking to get out of break even on that. So I would be careful. Chad, whether or not new subscribers should replicate your portfolio, et cetera. Uh, Angelo, uh, that's, that comes back to the time thing. And I know that time costs money because I charge by the day, by the week, by the month, by however you want to look at it, by the year. That's why I discount the longer-term subscriptions. I don't want everybody focused on the day-to-day -day action. I want you to hang with it as long as possible so you see the good, the bad, and hopefully the great. But when you, you don't want to – to go in and just because we're already long some stocks, you don't want to just rush out and buy them. Okay. Like CENX, which triggered um, not that long ago. And that's the one we talked about a few minutes ago. You don't want to put that stock on and, and I'm, I'm getting an email every day from somebody. Is it, is it time? Is it time? Is it time? No, uh, it, it didn't, it didn't even pull back enough for me to suggest that, that you get back in as a new position. But if you see a position, you should take it. It needed to pull back a little bit more before I would have taken it as a standalone position. Each position should be taken as a standalone position. Don't worry about See yourself as being a trader for a long, long time. Don't try to jump in on the stocks in the portfolio. For instance, we had some short. We still got a couple shorts on. But if you'd have jumped in the shorts uh, two months ago, you'd have jumped in right before they had a big retrace rally. Now, the people who were already in the shorts – they were just giving up some open profits. Uh, you know, it sucks. I don't know a milder way of putting it. But at least they're getting profits, whereas if you're just jumping in blindly, the market is not set up. There's two different things to think about. Once you're in a position, you follow the plan, okay? So that doesn't mean that you should jump into the position if you're not already in it. You should look for perfection going into the position, but once you're into it, accept what the market gives you and wait. Can we check the Wilshire 5000? Yeah, I'd be happy to do so. Um, I don't know the symbol. Anybody know the symbol? Wilshire. Wilshire. How do you spell that? Wilshire. Here we go. Wilshire 5000. Uh, there's several of these. Let's try this one. This is a uh, full market index, full cap. Okay. Uh, that looks pretty ugly. That looks worse or as bad as a rusty. So yeah, I mean, you've got, well, not, maybe not as bad as a Russell, but peak to trough, we dropped 16%. That's pretty, that's a lot for an index. Draw your line. This is just a retrace rally. So this is like it's in a lot of trouble. This is a weekly chart. This is a bow tie here, which would have triggered, I guess, right here. Like the P's, it had a, it had a throwback rally. Pretty serious leg higher. So it's it's still in trouble. Let me bang on a few of these sectors before I forget. Uh, I think the energies have bottomed out in here, and they're in the process of making some new highs. Uh, metals and mining also look pretty good, have made a nice run from lows, have bow tied. They've also gotten through this overhead supply like butter. Susan was just saying, what about overhead supply with a bow tie? Well, so far they've gotten through it. So, so far they're looking pretty good. So I'm still a bull there. Gold's looking pretty good. Gold took off yesterday, I guess, based on the Fed or whatever reasons. It doesn't matter. But it's taken off. We're looking to get long gold at this juncture. 
gold kind of just went straight up. It was kind of hard to get on. You can see, look at this, just kind of a, that really, it really didn't give you much time to get on. So that's why we're now looking to get on gold. That's 60% for the overall sector over a short period of time. They sort of just, no pun intended, melted up. Okay. Craig says, in a market analysis, up versus metals and mining, a dollar is done. Well, let's take a look at the dollar. And then we'll get to individual stocks in just one second. Yeah, dollar looks like it's in a lot of trouble. I've been bullish on the pound versus dollar. And there's been some really good uh, intraday and interday trades uh, happening there. Uh, but, yeah, look at that dollar down here at uh, brand new lows. Uh, let's take a look. Let's see if we've got a weekly bow tie on here. It's a little choppy, but you can see, yeah, the moving average is coming together. Let's take a look at a daily chart. Um, if you go all the way back to 2015, remember what I always say about if you have an all-time high or a major high, then the subsequent bow tie suggests that top is in place until it's exceeded. So the bow tie back here, which happened in early 2015, suggests the top is in place. But Dave, it's been all over the place since. Yeah, it's been all over the place, but at least you have a framework to work around. Now, this is a little too choppy for me to go after, but take a look at like the pound uh, dollar. That's been working its way higher as of late. So dollar down equals market. Does a dollar down equals markets up? Not necessarily, okay? Not necessarily. I remember a few years of, years back, they were – uh, what's his name? Ruben? Was that a, was that a, was he in the Fed or who was he? He was in the government. I forget what he did, but, um, he wanted a stronger dollar. Longer term, longer term, a current, a strong currency is good for a country. Okay. Now we could argue these macroeconomic things to the cows come home because it might take years for that to play out. So, Read the book on internet, uh, intermarket technical analysis. Murphy wrote a good one, or maybe the only one. But don't rush out and try to apply it. It only matters when it matters. I've talked about that extensively. I don't want to – we don't have time to get into it today. But, uh, yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily say that. Now, keep in mind that dollar down, commodities up, that's a little bit more – uh, truer agreement because commodities at this point in time are dollar denominated. All right, I have rambled quite a bit, but you've asked some good questions, so thanks for that. Uh, GSS, too, uh, too low price, too th uh, not thin, but also it's went from it's kind of a bottle rocket in here, so I would avoid that one. Uh, find something that's a little bit higher price than the golds. Okay, uh, Daffin says globalization, the currency manipulation has made the dollar correlations fuzzy at best. Yeah, it's a complex world, and things are changing fast. So what you need to do is just look at the charts is what I would recommend. Uh, I didn't cover all these sectors, but a lot of them, even the ones that are looking better like retail, have still look like a, just a big retrace to me. And until they make new highs, I wouldn't go after them. All right, Susan, have a good night. F-E-Y-E, F-E-Y-E. Uh, yeah, this looks pretty good. Uh, this one's been coming up in my scans. Uh, the reason that I haven't putting it on, notice I have this overhead supply drawn in, which is just right above the market. So that's the only thing I don't like about it. If it clears that, I might change my mind. But good eye, Greg, but uh, pay attention to that. Fed is goosey emerging markets. Yeah, EEM looks good. I've been look, I've been watching that, emerging markets. Um, this is something that I find kind of fascinating. Again, you need to watch everything. But look at the emerging markets coming off of these multi-year lows. Uh, on a weekly basis, though, they're not really – I guess it's uh, – oh, I don't know. I guess that's low enough. Let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Eh, seven or eight-year low, so I think that's legit. Take a look at your bow tie. I'm glad you pointed that out, Phil. Uh, take a look at your bow tie here. This is a significant bow tie. This will be a good market to be long, but I'm, I'm more excited about playing – Individual stocks. Yeah, I, can't, I don't want to talk about that bank because that's uh, that's on the Landry list. But, yeah, you're right. That foreign bank looks good. Okay. SM, that's going to be uh, – yeah, it looks good. Bow tie coming out of bow tie. It looks pretty good. You do have some resistance here, though. So I would find something that had less resistance if possible. ATI for my buddy Greg. ATI. Uh, yeah, that looks pretty good. Um, let's back the chart out. It's Metal Fab stock. You don't have a whole lot of resistance until 30. From 15 to 30, it's 100%. It triggered as a bow tie today, okay? So you're going to have to wait for the next setup there. 
HMY has been on a tear as of late. That's going to be a gold stock. Um, you need to wait for the next pullback. It's going to be a little bit dangerous to trade at this juncture, though, because it, it has made a pretty serious run. So wait for a pullback. Is it too late for which one are you asking about? WLL for Howard. Uh, yeah, WLL looks good, um, but it's also it's already triggered as a bow tie. And where's your overhead supply? Well, right here. Too much overhead supply, but you know, eh, it's a 50% move. I guess that'd be an okay deal, but I think I'd pass on that one and find something better in energy. CBK, thanks, a good show. You're welcome, Mr. Reese. CBK, glad to be here. Glad you're here. Uh, HV, a little high on this, kind of a lower price stock. I don't like this big gap back here. I see what you're seeing. My only problem is most of this run is just this one bar up. So it's just a little too crazy. I think I'd leave that alone. Also, volume, okay, but uh, price is kind of low based on the volume. VTAE for Robert. VTAE. VTAE. Uh, no. What do you want to do with that? You want to buy it? No. No. Draw your arrows. Yeah, it's there, but yeah, it's made a big gap in here, but it's, there's no structure there. Sometimes you just have to let them go. Joel wants to know about EGO. He's been waiting patiently. EGO looks good. Let's uh, zoom in a little bit. Uh, yeah, uh, it looks okay. Uh, a little choppy, but gold stocks can be choppy. I'd say it looks okay. A little overhead supply, a lot of overhead supply. I, I, uh, you know what? Take that back. I, I try to find something a little cleaner in gold. Uh, next week, we'll have one. Get into delayed service, and in about a week, you'll see a, a setup that I like. GSS? GSS. Yeah, we talked about that one. AUI for Joel. Uh, no, too much overhead resistance on that one, too. Okay, Amazon weekly prepared next thrust down. Amazon? Amazon's tough uh, to trade, but I do – sometimes these big cap stocks, the bigger they are, the harder they fall. Uh, too many days of the pullback, but guess what? Take a look at the weekly chart. Whoo, look at that. Stick a fork in that bad boy. Thrust down, pullback. Uh, Amazon, next stop, what, uh, 400? Or below. FCX, that's going to be a copper stock. Freeport, back moron. Uh, yeah, looks okay. It's pushing it to this overhead supply. For me, it would have to get past this overhead supply. Then you can have more overhead supply once it gets past that. So I think I would pass on that one. There's there's other metals out there. Greg, that's on a lander list. Can't talk about it. But uh, good eye. I'll give you that. Cousins for Ray, CZZ. C Z Z Z Z. Oops. C Z Z. Yeah, this looks fantastic. Uh, but it does have some overhead supply. But you know what? That's far enough to way to not worry about it. Uh, it's already triggered though. There's your bow tie. There's your thrust. It's already triggered. So yeah, wait for the next pullback. Good eye though. Good good eye. Oh, you were talking about a weekly on Amazon. Oh, good eye on that. Uh, Bob wants to know about N N N, the N stock. Um. Well, I don't like that it's just barely getting past the prior highs in here. Somebody all week kept asking me about BWXT or whatever, or BXWT, XWT, whatever it is. They're not here today, but um, it's just barely getting past its prior highs. So I would I would wait for it to bang on new highs. Also, it's a REIT. It's kind of hard for me to get too excited about REITs. Uh, short on CMG, great show. Thanks, Dennis. CMG. Yeah, too many days of the pullback, but I hear you. Uh, I heard uh, Chipotle's changing the name of his restaurant to In-N-Out. Do you provide specific buy and sell recommendations each week? Yes, I do. Look at that column I just talked about. You get the spreadsheet every day. Here's your buy. C-E-N-X, C and X, and sell short this one here. Okay? Every day. Now, some days it might not be anything to do. E D I T E D I T. Uh, this one I've been watching, but it's it's gotten a little too crazy. Uh, this was one of those uh, IPOs where uh, I have a specific breakout strategy where the entry was actually here, and the secondary strategy it, it just got a little too crazy to take a secondary strategy. So it it already ran up two hundred something percent. So I would leave this one alone uh, at this juncture. 
Dave, I know Position Trading Weeklies gives us some of the first moves. However, would you have less false starts if you use weeklies? The problem – it switched to daily for entries. The problem with weeklies, especially on the short side, but even on the long side sometimes, go in and look – take a look at CNN. I'll just pull one out the air. CENX. We seem to be beating a dead horse in that one this week, okay? Uh, you would just be getting around to a weekly signal on this one, and I don't know. Maybe it might be done. Uh, I hope it's not done. But you're going to miss – you already missed 50% of the – 50 percent a 50% move, easy for me to say, in that stock. So I think the weeklies would have too much lag to that. With the bow tie pattern and, and the oils recently, it's been great. Well, thank you, Howard, for noticing. I appreciate that. And that's the beauty of that pattern. When it works, boy, it's it, it's right big. And if you're wrong, so what? You know, you get stopped out. We couple more. we got to go. Uh, KKR cost per month. It varies on how long you stay with the service. Um, just go to my website and then go into fast track. Uh, I ha recently had a big, uh, a huge yearly sale. If you are, uh, if you're watching today, uh, call me up and, um, or shoot me an email right here. Fast track. Or you can go to the store too. stores up here, but yeah, call me up and I'll give you that, uh, that promo code. In fact, you know what? I'll give it to you right now. P R O M O 500. And I'll give you $500 off the yearly service. Promo 500. All one word, all lowercase. You know, you just spend an hour and a half with me. I'll give you the promo code. And that's good until Monday, I think is what, how it's set up. Promo 500. KKR for Howard. Thanks for your interest. So I appreciate that. KKR, um, we've got that big bar back here. Let's zoom in a little bit. Uh, it looks okay. It's kind of working its way higher. I think you could possibly find something better. They're in financial services, asset management. It must be oil show related. So I, I think I'd rather trade an oil field stock than them. Thanks for, for your interest, Robert. I appreciate that. CBK? Yeah, we did that one. Ego? Yeah, I got a big ego. <laughs> now, oh, ego, the stock. Yeah, it looks good. This is a uh, this is a gold stock. Uh, again, you got a lot of overhead supply with this, so dig through your golds and try to find something with a little bit less overhead supply. We got one on the watch list for today. We're looking at. Okay, uh, I think I need to go ahead and wrap things up. We're going way over time here. I had a blast today. I, I usually have a blast doing these shows. I appreciate you guys and girls taking the time and your busy schedules to be here. Anything unanswered, shoot me an email, David Dave Landry dot com if we don't talk again everybody have a fantastic weekend uh if there's a question that requires a lot of thought i'll uh, cover it in next week's show if it's a quick answer i'll be happy to get right back to you so again everybody have a fantastic uh night you're welcome ray you're welcome joe you're welcome howard you're welcome travis uh thank you guys so much and then i uh, hope to see you again uh and girls next week thank you